In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, uh, we're getting closer to the end of the liturgical year. And as you know, the end of October is the Feast of Christ the King. So already some of the uh, prayers and some of the lessons in the Masses are referring to our Lord Jesus Christ being in charge, being, being King of all creation. It's very important that we remember, yes, our Lord is King of all creation. He's King of heaven, King of earth. Uh, but his reign on earth, a lot of that depends on us and how it, how it is that we are living the life of grace. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ wants to rule this earth, but he wants to rule this earth through us. And I think that's why we see so little rule of Christ the King anymore, is that so many people of the Christians and the Catholics, uh, so many people have renounced and put off uh, living the Christian life. And so we see our Lord ruling less and less, uh, you know, actually. But uh, in, our Lord is still king. There's no problem there. But seeing his kingship is another thing that depends on us. And as you know, um, the devil also has a title of kind of power in this world. He's called the, um, the prince's he is the, in charge of the princes of the world of this darkness. Meaning, uh, it is correct to refer to the devil as being prince of this world. You remember uh, when our Lord was tempted three times by Satan at the beginning of his public ministry, or just uh, before he was baptized. Uh, our Lord uh, allowed the devil to take him up to the, this highest mountain and the devil showed him all the kingdoms of this world and the devil said uh, i'll give you all this power if you bow down to me well the devil wasn't really telling a lie the devil does have a rule and power over all the kingdoms of this world and as we know our lord turned down the offer and said no we're only to worship god and no one else but uh, the point is the devil d does have a power over this world and this is constantly confronting us but it's up to you and me, as Catholics and as Christians, uh, it's up to you and me to live the life of grace so that Christ's kingship dominates over the princes of the world of this darkness. And that's what we're learning in today's Mass, is that all of us need to put on what's called the spiritual armor to be protected from the onslaughts or the attacks of the devil. So our Lord's domination has a lot to do with winning the perpetual war against the devil. Uh, we, should not we should not underestimate the devil. He carries on a fight to the death, war against our Lord, by hunting down the souls of humanity. Between our Lord and the devil, there is nothing spared. Each one of our souls is so important to both of them uh, because our Lord wants us to win in order to give glory to his Father. Because our victories against the devil are his victories against the devil. And the devil wants to win us because he has pure envy. He cannot stand the thought that the place where he, what he lost in heaven, that we weak human beings can gain those places. So it's pure envy. It doesn't make him any happier, uh, but he just cannot stand the thought that someone can get to heaven instead of him. So he carries on a fight to the death against our Lord for getting the souls of humanity. A lot of people do not take this battle seriously because they do not want to admit the reality of a supernatural world. And by the way, the devil doesn't mind that. The devil, the devil doesn't mind being sort of, oh, um, sorry for the expression, poo-pooed, not taken seriously. He doesn't mind that. If he's hidden and nobody recognizes him and pretend it doesn't exist, he doesn't care. What he cares about is that he has influence over souls. It's a little bit like venial sin and mortal sin. Uh, the devil doesn't mind if we don't commit huge mortal sins. He's just happy if he can get us in the regular habit of committing venial sin, this constant compromise with, this, with the world, this constant separation from God. He's happy with that. And then on the last day of our lives, he can present himself again to us and say, you have been such an unfaithful Catholic. How do you expect to get to heaven? He'll just fill us, fill us with thoughts of despair, and that might be the end of it for us. So the devil doesn't mind doing smaller things, unnoticeable things, just as long as he's always there, always present, always in his mind, always in control. And we know that the 
church, the modernist church, has gone this direction too. So many prayers have been taken out, for sure, the baptism ceremony, but also other ceremonies, prayers which talk about the devil and how God is more powerful than the devil and how our Lord Jesus Christ is casting out the devil. Those are just taken out of our liturgy. And uh, it's because the modernist church also wants to go along with this trend of saying that, oh, there was too much focus on the devil before and that was just a bunch of superstition and now we're going to make people really love God because they love God, not just because they're fighting against some imagined evil force called the devil. You know, that's how they talk. Uh, but no, the reality is the devil exists. He doesn't mind being invisible, but he certainly wants to take away from us our supernatural life. And there's a lot of people that prefer living in that state, unfortunately, unfortunately. They are already too comfortable with their natural situation. So they don't want to think about the supernatural one. And they have what appears to be stability and security in these things. But that's only stability for this world, not for the next one. Nevertheless, as we know, the normal state of the Christian is the life of combat. We're always fighting, in a good sense. Not fighting with each other, that would be bad. But fighting in a good sense, meaning the devil is going to try to continue attacking us, the world is going to attack us, and then our own weak selves are going to attack us. Every time I don't want to do a job, every time I don't want to study, every time I don't want to pray, that's just my selfishness getting at me. And uh, no, we can't let that happen. We have to do battle against those things. The normal state of a Christian is combat because of the reason I just gave you, but also because the world naturally persecuted our divine Lord when he was here due to his holiness. Uh, no one likes, well, how should I say that? Not everyone likes a very good example and a very good person being in their presence because there's a lot of wickedness in the world. And when you get a very good person in the presence of evil people, they, a lot of times, feel reproached, you know? They've got a bad conscience, and all of a sudden, here comes this purity or simplicity walking in the room. They can't stand it. They want to either crush that person, take the virtue out of them, or, yeah, or destroy the person, which is what they ended up doing to our Divine Lord. Well, uh, we, Catholics, are the continuation of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth. So it's perfectly logical that the world is going to persecute us too. But these victories that we win against the world and the flesh and the devil, these victories that we win against these, things, these forces are useful to our Lord. They are part of his cross. So in a certain sense, they help him in the redemption of the world. And that means they're part of his victory. Our Lord's greatest prayer to his father was the crucifixion. That was his greatest glorification of his father, was the crucifixion. And it's his, it's his greatest victory, too. That was the undoing of the devil's kingdom. When we are doing some suffering in order to say no to the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, we are joining in that greatest prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to put myself to death in order to give glory to the Father. Yes, keep in mind that the battle is not always from outside the Christian. All of us know that we have human def defects, which by ourselves we are not able to conquer. That's not caused by God. That's caused by the orig original sin and the effects of original sin. But it is allowed by God. It's part of God's plan. So... You know, we all have some sort of defects that we have to fight against, and we must make our own efforts against them. But don't expect to win all your battles just by yourself against your human defects. We know that grace has to step in sooner or later and give us the victory over these defects, because by ourselves, we can do nothing. By ourselves, we are powerless against these defects. We must rely on the holy sacraments. We must, we must rely on prayer and sacrifice. And this is the battle and the soldiers that our Lord demands. 
people doing battle against their own defects and the soldiers being all this power of grace and this protection of the spiritual armor. These victories become the victories of our Lord Jesus Christ and he presents them to his Father for his Father's greater, greater glory. We've all had our innocent time in our life where things kind of came with consolation to us. You know, our baptism and our first communion and our first confession and our catechism, that all comes with consolation. But sooner or later, all those truths we learned and memorized very well in our catechism, they all kind of come to life when our faith is challenged by outside evil or our own defects. So, continuing with this, continuing with this theme that the normal state of a Catholic is to be in combat against wickedness. We are allowed uh, some consolation and some parties and some happiness, and that's fine. But I think all of us know that those are um, exceptions. That's like the, the recess period, the recreation from what is really the life of a Catholic. If our Lord were to give us full-time recreation or full-time consolation, full-time uh, you know, um, outward happiness, uh, I think that we all would say, well, then what can be so great about heaven? We are, we're already here with this kind of happiness and peace now. I don't really need to go to heaven. Well, you know, God is pretty smart. He wants us to desire true happiness, which is heaven. So he's not going to give us a full-time secondary happiness here below. And that's why our normal state is a state of combat. And just once in a while, a little bit of recreation. So speaking about this, you know, fight and this combat. The name most frequently applied to God by the prophets is Lord of hosts. And hosts in this situation means Lord of armies, forces. His divine son shows himself as the Lord who is mighty in battle, Psalms 23. And then in the 44th Psalm, when we speak of Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride, the 44th Psalm says that we approach each other in battle array. Our Lord is dressed for battle. We are dressed for battle, but not to make battle against each other. No, to join each other in battle, to take on the enemy. So Christianity, my friends, is not for the faint-hearted. You might have noticed that. When uh, modernists get a hold of the Catholic religion and they water down all the doctrine, uh, it's inevitable outcomes an immoral life. So, you know, that's happened. I think we've all read plenty of scandals and I don't know what not about the church in the last 50 and 60 years now. That's what happens. The doctrine is watered down and the morality becomes bad. They stop doing battle against Satan. Christianity is not for the faint-hearted. Until the day when our Lord wins the fat final battle against Satan, Power is in the hands of the rulers of this world of darkness. Isn't that terrible? But it's the truth. Uh, last week we considered that, that man thinks he's in control of the whole situation. And we've seen evidence the last few weeks to see where man is really trying to put himself forward to say he's in control. And those, who are, those of us who practice the faith kind of understand that we're still allowed to get together in a little church gatherings, but... Uh, that's sort of an allowance, you know, sort of a, uh, an indulgence uh, by man nowadays uh, uh, because man is more in control. These are smoke screens. These are distractions and confusions. They're not the reality. God is in control. And just as I said earlier in the, in the conference, uh, he allows neg negative things to happen. This is part of his uh, providence, and this is part of his plan. And if Christianity is reduced to just a few people practicing it, because the princes of the power of this darkness have taken so much control, that's because God wants to sanctify those souls more. The perilous honor that we were talking about last week. God wants to sanctify those souls more. They may be fewer in number, but they're winning bigger victories for him. So, yes, the world is in the hands of the rulers of the world of this darkness, but those of us who still go around 
living in the life of grace and doing the work of our Lord Jesus Christ are winning bigger battles for him. But it's precisely against them, the rulers of this world, that, uh, sorry, I don't want to make a revolutionary talk here, the princes of the world of this darkness, um, it's precisely against them that we must take to ourselves the armor of God, and we must wear it all. So, uh, the, the ones that we're meant to do battle against, as St. Paul says, uh, these are not flesh and blood. These are principalities and powers. That's a reference to angels. You probably know that angels come in nine rankings or nine choirs, and angels, archangels, uh, principalities, powers, dominations, virtues, all the way up to cherubim and seraphim. Well, principalities and powers, those are fallen angels in this case, the, one that, the ones that St. Paul is talking about. They are superior intelligences. They're superior to us. They are in the high places of the air around us. By ourselves, we don't stand a chance making war against them. But with the life of grace, we do. We are invincible because of the life of grace. So how are we to wrestle against them? And the answer is by becoming light. I don't mean the light as opposed to heavy. I mean light as opposed to darkness. We become light by having the life of our Lord Jesus Christ alive in our soul. Uh, at the end of our lives, we will see the perfect vision of light of our Lord Jesus Christ, but until that time, we have light in us without seeing all of it. By our baptism, our ears have been opened that we might hear our Lord Jesus Christ when he speaks to us. So through our catechism, through our readings, through our classes, through conferences, we're constantly hearing the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our faith gives us the certainty about this truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, as real as if we saw it with our own eyes. Faith is the shield, the spiritual armor. We, uh, St. Paul says we must be guarded, we must be protected by the shield of faith. Faith is not just the kind of the worldly sense we hear about. You get a bunch of soldiers together, they're going to go into combat, and they say, keep the faith. I think that's the, you know, the military um, slogan of the Navy. Um, always faithful. But that's just kind of keep the faith in their own physical power. Strictly, the faith is the belief in God and all that he has taught us based on the authority of the one revealing so, reading the Holy Bible, studying the Catechism, all the lessons we get from the Mass, we, can't, we don't have the evidence to understand all these things. But since our Lord Jesus Christ is the one telling us about these things, we have the faith. And so that's the def one definition of faith. Belief in all the things that God has told us based on the authority of the one revealing. But another definition of faith is that confidence in God to give us the rewards of our efforts in practicing the faith. So, um, when I say, when we have to keep the shield of faith to protect us from the world, the flesh, and the devil, it's those two things. Have the belief in God based on the authority of God revealing. So that's just the supernatural spirit. And then also, the confidence in God that he's gonna deliver on his promises because we've kept the faith. That's the shield. Uh, the devil wants to attack us and tell us that all our efforts are useless, we put up the shield. I believe in what God has told me, and I'm sure he's going to deliver on his promises. The world attacks us, saying, um, you know, you keep yourself poor when you can have all these goods. You can focus on goods and have your happiness here rather than waiting for the next life. We put up the shield. It says, no. God says uh, the life that's really worth living is the one that's above rather than living for this one. And... Um, the shield also says, and God will deliver on that promise. And then probably the worst attacker, again, is, is ourselves. You know, we just, we want our own honor. We want our own ease. Uh, we, want, we want our own power. All kinds of things. The self and, uh, self and the ego insist on with us. Again, put up the shield, the shield of faith. It says, no, we believe in what God has told us. He speaks about a supernatural kingdom, not about this natural kingdom of happiness. And put up the shield God will deliver on that promise and he will make us much happier in heaven 
being full of him rather than being full of ourselves. That's the shield of faith, which we constantly have to put up against the world, the flesh, and the devil. It protects us from every sort of injury. It blunts the fiery darts of the world, the shield of faith does, does and it repels the fury of our own passions. We're not going to den deny that we have passions. We're not going to deny that the devil exists. These things really do exist, and we need, and just as the devil is strong, just the passions are strong, we need a stronger armor to hold it all back. And that is the spiritual armor that St. Paul speaks about, especially the shield of faith. Faith is essentially the supernatural life. And the shield of faith allows us to escape the artful snares of the most wicked ones. So, my dear faithful, pray that we have this spiritual armor. Pray that we de desire the supernatural life, that we don't just get happy or satisfied with the natural life. That would be the devil's first victory with us. Just pretend he doesn't exist and just pretend you have happiness in this life and you'll be fine. That's so untrue. All of us need the life of grace in the soul, which eventually will be the life of God in heaven. If we don't have that, then we are truly miserable, even if we don't feel it. So we ask our Blessed Mother to, um, you know, make this very realistic for us so that we're ready to sacrifice everything like she did and like she does in order to have this life of grace full in our soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.